What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and today we will be reviewing a brand new album from the one and only Taylor Swift titled The Tortured Poets Department. Now I want to give a bit of a disclaimer here just like I did in my review for Found Heaven by Conan Gray as well as my review for Guts by Olivia Rodrigo. If you are a newer viewer and I'm sure a lot of people who click on this video are probably newer viewers of mine, I just want you to know I have only recently recently started reviewing music. In the five years that my channel has existed, I've almost exclusively talked about movies and games. But to paraphrase what I said in those videos, music has meant almost just as much to me as all of those other mediums, and I just kind of love talking about whatever piece of art I want to talk about, and that's sort of what my channel is becoming now, and so I have started to review albums that I think I... Uh, that I think are worth talking about and that I want to talk about. And this should come as a surprise to no one, but I am a big Taylor Swift fan, though I didn't used to be. In fact, I used to be one of those people who was like, I, I never got to the level of like Kanye fans, for example, but I did used to be one of those people who was like, I don't get the hype. I mean, like her, you know, her hits are catchy, but like, what, what, what the fuck is? Why is everybody? Why is everyone so crazy about her? Then I took a massive deep dive into her discography in like 2021, 2022, and I fucking fell in love. <laughs> Tale as old as time. Because of that, I had naturally very high expectations for this album. She has always been so good at defining her eras and having everyone stand on its own and this shift into the new like visual aesthetic for this tortured poets department era really excited me now in this moment as i'm filming this video it is 5 19 a.m i stayed up all night so that i could listen to the album right when it dropped just like my first listen through not taking any notes nothing i just wanted to sit back get lost in my leds and experience the album without the weight of notes on my shoulders so i listened to the album and then i took Took a bit of a break, jumped in the shower, blah blah blah, and then when I was done, I came back and I listened to the album again, but this time, with each track, I took notes for this review so that I could have a pretty well-informed opinion. But of course, the first thing I did when I finished listening to the album on that first listen through um, is open Instagram to see how people were reacting to it. Didn't get any reactions, but I did get one brand new post from T Swizzy herself, <laughs> where she dropped a surprise on us, as she tends to do, but this is a pretty monumental surprise. I mean, this is a bigger surprise than a lot of other things that she's done, and that is, she didn't just release one album tonight. She released two. That's right, the Tortured Poets Department era is a double album phenomenon, and I just want to say, I have not listened to the second album yet, which is titled The Tortured Poets Department, The Anthology, because I just wanted to give my review of the standard edition of the album The Tortured Poets Department. These 16 tracks that work as their own contained album, I wanted to give my opinion on that, so after this review is uploaded, I'm gonna listen to the anthology version of the album and then give my review on that most likely and then I might have to make an update video talking about my updated thoughts on this whole tortured poets department chronology as a whole after I get the full context of the, the rest of this release so this video is part one for the main album and then part two will be for the anthology version and then I may or may not make a part three which is just my updated thoughts after I've had some time to sit on both of these things uh, about this whole era. As far as the Tortured Poets Department goes, this is a 16-track album, and it was written entirely by Taylor Swift and two longtime friends and collaborators, Jack Antonoff and Aaron Desner. It is, in effect, a moody and cinematic synth-pop record that works also as kind of Taylor's lo-fi bedroom pop era, if Midnight's wasn't already that. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the gays and the theys, what I will say is that this is definitely Taylor's most personal and self-reflective work yet. Very much, like, possibly so, I would say. It is very lyrically dense and surprisingly melancholic. I mean, th this is probably, I gotta say, this is probably Taylor's saddest album. And I am honestly 
fascinated by it. Let's get into these tracks. Track 1 is titled Fortnite. Don't even make the joke. It is old at this point. It was old the day she announced the name of the track. It lived and died in that single day. Jesus Christ, do not hit up my comments with that stupid ass fucking joke. <laughs> it is titled Fortnite and it features Post Malone. And it does a good job at setting the tone for the album with these soft and punchy synths and a very lo-fi vibe. It also hits us with some pretty great melodies, no surprise there. And I also really enjoy how the harmonies and vocal layering build throughout the song. It, this whole album, at least a lot of tracks on this album definitely feel like they are building to something. There's also some pretty interesting lyrics on this song, surprise surprise, but they're also surprisingly blunt and darkly comedic at certain points, especially when she's straight up saying I want to kill her and I want to kill him. And while Post Malone's contribution to the track is quite enjoyable in the time that it has, I do feel that he is a little underutilized on this track. It's not as scandalous as what happened with Lana Del Rey on the original version of Snow on the Beach. Of course, Taylor later on after hearing all of those complaints and criticisms released another version in which Lana Del Rey was had a much more prominent presence on that track. But nevertheless, I did want a little bit more from him, especially considering that Post Malone is actually a very talented singer. Track number two is our title track. It is titled The Tortured Poets Department, and has some very catchy melodies and some promptly melancholic lyrics. I will say though, some of these lyrics do kind of warrant a bit of an eye roll, especially the, the F-bombs in this song that just feel like such a shoot. Look, I curse like a sailor. I, I'm truly a potty mouth. I have no problem with profanity in music, but in this song, it kind of comes out of nowhere, and especially with the fact that it's just sort of like thrown away as a bit of an ad lib, and just the way it's delivered. I don't know. It just feels very horned in just for the sake of like having it in there. It's one of those things where it's like shoot into the middle of one singular word. However, in the second half of this song, we actually get some name drops and the lyrics noticeably become much more honest and emotional. Unfortunately though, I do feel that the track is way too long and while the introspective lyrics do a lot for me at certain points, the production doesn't really do much for me to warrant that length. It's not a terrible track by any means, but it, it was a little disappointing as a title track. I would say. Track number three is titled My Boy Only Breaks His Favorite Toys. Yeah, it, just in case you didn't notice, the title, the, not, not the title tracks, the titles of the tracks on this album, th th this album stands out from like every other Taylor Swift album in a lot of ways, but I think one of the biggest ways in which it stands out is the... <laughs> the style of the track titles. Anyway, in this track, I really love some of the vocal melodies on the chorus and post-chorus in particular. The percussion of the song is very much brought to the top of the mix, and I would say all the better for it. The synths feel a little more subtle this one, and I think it has a really nice build to it. It also hits us with our first truly great bridge of the album, which is typical of Taylor at this point. She's kind of the queen of bridges. I will say though, a part that made me like tilt my head is she, she references Ken's in this song in light of barbie obviously she she references like all the kens out there and i was just like huh interesting and i do find this track very lyrically interesting as the vast majority of taylor swift songs will be but i it does leave a lot to be desired for me track four is titled down bad and this is when we get a bit of a production switch because it starts off with this really interesting, very pleasing on the ear sample of, I, I'm honestly not really sure what instrument it is. It might be a synth, it might be, it might be a guitar. I don't know, it's really unique. I don't feel like I've heard it before, so it is definitely a good thing. And I will say that this track has a great chorus. It is catchy, memorable, honest, and not overdone. It's actually very subtle and held back. You're not getting a Cruel Summer type track with this song. The chorus on this song kind of sneaks up on you a little bit. Also, the F-bombs in this song, unlike the other song I talked about, are actually very fitting, and there's so many, which is why it's weird that they're so fitting, but maybe that's also why they fit so well, because you sort of just get used to it. But no, like, it does thematically fit the song very well, and this has to be. <laughs> I mean, this album has the most F-bomb out of any Taylor Swift album and and look if no other song on this album had any f-bombs 
this album would still be the album with the most f-bombs in taylor swift's discography purely because of this song it's crazy i think this is a very moody and very entrancing track and on this track taylor seems to be the most uncensored genuine and honest about her feelings than she's ever been before she she really isn't holding back on this one track number five is titled so long london and it opens with these almost operatic vocal layerings and harmonies that uh, it was pretty it took me back a little bit but i really liked it because taylor sounds really good on it and that shifts us into some pulse pounding synths that got us through almost the entire track and the lyrics are kind of devastating which this perspective of looking back on a relationship and trying to determine like why it ended just trying to make sense of it all and all the pain and sorrow and longing that comes with that essentially this philosophy of we had a good run but it didn't work out that being said i will say i kind of like i was enjoying the song as i was listening to it but then it just kind of ended and i, and I kind of wanted it to build to a more satisfying climax track number six is called but daddy i love him <laughs> why the fuck did i do that i'm cutting that out i'm cutting that out no, I'm not. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> it is called But Daddy I Love Him, and whoa, pump the brakes, Taylor. Are you taking some shots at organized religion in America with this one? This song also has a great build into the chorus, but as far as the chorus itself goes, I find the vocal melodies on this one a little awkward, and I'm not entirely sure if I love them. Thematically, though, this song seems to be hinting that some hyper-religious people of sorts didn't take too kindly to Taylor and the nature of this relationship that she was in. And Taylor, through the lyrics on this track, fairly introspectively calls them out on some of their hypocrisy in their actions. Honestly, the lyrics on this one are my favorite aspect of the track. Track number seven is titled Fresh Out the Slammer, and it's sort of about falling back into an old fling after a major heartbreak. It also provides a little bit more insight into how the previous relationship in question ended, describing it as a prison where Taylor sort of felt that she was, she was in this cell under the shadow of everything that this person was feeling but never could really fully express. I didn't love this track the first time I heard it, but upon re-listen, it is growing on me a little bit more as I come to understand it more, because as I said, this album is very lyrically dense, and I think it's gonna take a while for a lot of these tracks to resonate with people. Track number eight is titled Florida, featuring Florence and the Machine. And right from the get-go, it has an incredible build-up from the very beginning with these exhilarating, pulse-pounding bass and synths. Also, Florence Florence's contribution to this track is honestly incredible. I do prefer it to the Post Malone feature on the on the uh, first track. Not only are the vocals and the lyrics amazing on her verse, but she also has a very very long runtime on the track. Like her verse is pretty lengthy. There's also some pretty suggestive, some pretty risky or quote unquote edgy lyrics on this song for a Taylor song. Let let's keep it real. And it gets to the point where like the lyrics themselves kind of call it out at one point, literally asking, is this a bad thing to say in a song? And this is absolutely a song of going out and like just going on a road trip, a, a complete fling, not romantic, purely platonic, just losing your mind with a best friend and just being completely reckless in the midst of your heartbreak, trying to forget your sorrows for a while, drown them in whatever it may be, alcohol, weed, you name it. <laughs> also notably, there are like some massive, like unexpected, like booming drums and percussion mixes on the chorus here. It doesn't last for very long at all, but it's very welcome. I, I did enjoy it. Track number nine is titled Guilty As Sin, the question mark. And my first thought when this track started playing is that the drums on this sound like a fucking garage band loop. The rest of the production saves it for sure. It, it does end up working, but within those first few seconds, I was like, this is like the default drum loop that GarageBand gives you just when you click the drummer and let it do its thing. <laughs> this song is one of the most lyrically dense on the album, in my opinion. It's very metaphorical, and because of that, it, it's a little hard to crack on, a, uh, on an initial, like, listen, and even, like, 
a, a couple more listens after that. I'm still having a hard time fully understanding what it's saying, but I think I got it. Nevertheless, I will say I do think it's understandable enough to still be emotionally effective. I've really come to love the chorus on this one in particular, where we get some even more suggestive lyrics, especially toward the back half of the song. Track number 10 is titled, Who's Afraid of Little Old Me? Just a little old me. Who would be afraid of me? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm me. You know, who would be afraid of me? Oh boy, should we be afraid of her? This track is going to be a massive talking point in any conversation regarding this album for the next few months. Guaranteed. This track is going to piss the fuck off Taylor's haters. It almost feels like it's directly targeted at them. <laughs> and there is a great intense suspense factor that is built here through the production and the lyrics and melodies as Taylor is pretty hostily taking shots at the media. As I said, the production is immaculate on this. It truly captures the tone that Taylor is going for with this song, and not only that, it very perfectly complements her vocals and the lyricism. It's also kind of strangely triumphant. I mean, it's kind of a bad bitch anthem in a way, in a lot of ways. And the lyrics are pretty scathing, I'm not gonna lie, with Taylor making some pretty bold claims about the media and the role that the media has played and that she has played in shaping her public perception throughout her career. She comes off very angry on the track, obviously intentionally, through her vocals, and it's pretty effective. The emotion is incredibly tangible. It kind of reminds me that Taylor Swift can... She's also kind of a really fucking good actress. <laughs> I will say, particularly some lyrics in the last half of this song, they're gonna get people talking. And part of me is looking forward to that discourse, and part of me is not. <laughs> no, but seriously, like, th this track... Look out for this one, like, people are gonna have shit to say about this, she's gonna piss off so many people, but I just, I kinda love, I don't even know how to describe this, I, I just love that Taylor doesn't, if anything, this album establishes that she's not afraid, she's not holding back anything, like, so much of this out, al this album sort of feels like a spiritual sister to Emails I Can't Send by Sabrina Carpenter, almost every song on this album feels like an aspect of Taylor's mind that you don't feel like you should be seeing, but you are, and she's letting you in. And this track in particular, she says some shit. Track number 11 is titled, I Can Fix Him, in parentheses, no really I can. And it is exactly what the title would suggest. The production here feels like something out of a western, honestly, and, and it really works. Unfortunately though, Overall, while the premise on this one is intriguing, I kind of am a little underwhelmed by it. Track number 12 is titled LOML, an acronym that most commonly means love of my life, but in this song we find out by the end actually means loss of my life, which I actually found to be <laughs> very impactful. I did not expect that. It's a great lyric to end on. This is a very melancholic, moody, entrancing piano ballad with some very poetic lyrics. And this works as a pretty devastating painting of a past relationship that Taylor is reminiscing on, and I also want to say, I feel like this song is sort of a testament to how self-reflective this album is, even more so than Midnight's, where she literally admitted to her narcissistic tendency tendencies. Because this song is looking back on the relationship and looking back on the more negative sides of it, once again trying to deconstruct how it ended and sort of examining that whole aspect of it, and Taylor doesn't shy away from taking some shots at herself. Some very effective strings come into the last third of this song that do solidify it as a true tearjerker for me. Overall, it's just a very soft, gentle song that will definitely get you in the feels for sure, and as I said, I love the, the sort of double entendre of the title. Track number 13 is called I Can Do It With A Broken Heart, and this is the first and only, really, sad girl banger on the album. It has an incredible pace and melodies and some pretty revealing lyrics about Taylor battling depression in the midst of fame. I really particularly love the lyric, lights, camera, bitch, smile. <laughs> some great 80s style dance pop synth make for a truly smashing chorus that is also very dark darkly comedic. It's just sort of like, <laughs> I'm fine. What do you mean? I'm fine. You know, I kind of want to 
from time to time, but I'm fine, you know, I'm singing, I'm dancing, totally okay. Like, it's that kind of dark humor, which I love. I, I think people forget, Taylor's kind of a comedian. She's kind of really fucking funny a lot of the time. <laughs> but also, like, on the flip side of that coin, this track also comes off strangely confident, like, like you're, you're confident in your ability to act like you're fine when you're not. <laughs> the last three bars of the song in particular are, are pretty funny, especially in the way that they're delivered. Track number 14 might as well be a diss track. Uh, it's even called The Smallest Man Who Ever Lived. If you guys thought All Too Well made a certain guy look bad, Holy shit. First things first, in the opening verses of this song, she directly references Jehovah's Witnesses, kind of tying back into some of the religious subject matter that she touched on previously on the album. I'm not gonna dig too deeply into that, but it is there to analyze, and, and she's saying something. She is saying something about religion on this album, but I just haven't quite cracked it yet. Production-wise, this track treats us with some soft pianos and synths. And once again, Taylor presents us with a pretty scathing track. As I said, it might as well be a diss track, and it seems to be very clearly directly taking shots at a former partner. Where she explicitly states that she does not miss what they had at all, and if anything, she just has some pretty brutal questions for this guy. Also, very unexpected, the final minute and 45 seconds just about... I about shit myself just now. Why must things fall? I don't want you to fall. If you could, like, stay there for the rest of the video... That would be great. As I was saying, the final minute and 45 seconds of this song are massive with the production. It's really cinematic. With Taylor also bringing in the most devastating lyrics of the song by far. It really works. It's very impactful and goddamn did this guy fuck up. Track number 15 is titled The Alchemy. This song has some banger melodies and immaculate production. And it's actually in the midst of the depression that the majority of of this album is a very sweet and sentimental love song where Taylor sings about coming out of this darkness and finding something beautiful in her journey out of it. It's actually pretty impactful. It made me cry the first time I heard it. It's genuinely very sweet and the lyrics on the chorus in particular are quite quite clever and are only going to make it all the more emotional for anyone who is aware of what's going on in Taylor's life at the moment, and let's be honest, who isn't? I think my biggest takeaway with this track though is actually how good of a job it does at discussing more so how much this person loves her. You know, in a lot of her other love songs, she's talking about how much she loves the other person with some sprinkles in there talking about how this other person makes her feel, but this song is almost entirely talking about how much this person loves her. And I, I don't know, I just thought it was really beautiful, especially in, in the way it's executed. Track number 16, our final track here, is titled Clara Bow. A track that is seemingly a reminiscence on Taylor's upbringing and her dreams of stardom and the various people who told her that she could make it and the many, many more people who told her that she couldn't. And she's sort of using references to past celebrities such as Clara Bow or Stevie Nicks to sort of use as a mirror to reflect on her own experiences. In effect, it's actually a very thought-provoking album closer that asks a lot of questions about who Taylor really knows herself to be as a person, calling out a pretty depressingly bittersweet reality of how Taylor sort of keeps up an act in front of certain people and in certain environments, and this song... <sighs> The reason it's bittersweet is like, it's weird. Can you spoil an album? I don't know if you can spoil an album, but it's, it seems to be this concept of Taylor looking at the versions of herself that people love the most and kind of thinking like, the versions of me that people love the most are the versions of me that are the most not me. I thought that was a pretty profound note to end the album on, and again, many people might disagree with, with my reading of that, but I also think there's multiple readings that can be taken away from this one, one, and I definitely saw a lot of them, but that was the one that stuck with me the most. So, in conclusion, while I think the album needs some time to grow on me, 
I do think that this is a very welcome turn from Taylor and in many ways is definitely an outlier from all of her previous albums. I think it has some of her densest and best lyrics ever and also is pretty definitively her most vulnerable album in a lot of ways. I think I kinda love this one, despite a few tracks here and there really not working for me all that much. I've listed my favorites here if you guys are curious about what my favorites are, and these aren't ranked in any order, I just listened to this album tonight and I've only listened to it twice, but my favorites here are Down Bad, Florida, Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, Love of My Life, or Loss of My Life, and I Can Do It With A Broken Heart, as well as The Smallest Man Who Ever Lived, and The Alchemy. Those are my seven favorite tracks on the album i can count something i kind of want to add here remember the discourse around reputation how polarizing that album was this album i already know makes the reputation discourse look like child's play it makes it look like a fucking joke this is going to be taylor's you either love it or you hate it album and it's going to be extremely polarizing and as i said i'm looking forward to seeing some conversations, but I'm also not looking forward to it because there's a lot of hostility out there. But truly, like, I'm really curious to see what the overall critical reception is of this album. I mean, I saw it had like a meta score of like 91, but then I also saw that some big news outlet gave it like a, a three out of five star and, and described it as a massive misstep in her discography. So I don't know, the, the, the reviews for this are probably gonna be all over the place. We'll see in the coming days what people think of it. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. Be sure to let me know down in the comments what you thought of the album. What is your favorite Taylor Swift album? Are you a Swift? Swifty, are you not? Are you a late stage Swifty or are you a lifelong Swifty? Late stage Swifties, let me level with you here for a second. Tell me what was it that made you turn from a Taylor Swift denier to a Taylor Swift lover? <laughs> Guys, be sure to leave a like on this video if you so please. Also, hit up that comment section, subscribe if you would like, and if you want to go that extra mile, turn on bell notifications so you get notified every time I upload new content. If you would like to follow my personal and creative endeavors outside of the YouTube channel, you can follow me on Instagram at the Xavier Reichbaum, or you can follow my production company that I founded on Instagram at the official Instagram account for it, which is simply at Headspace Productions. I also have a podcast titled The Headspace Podcast, now available on all major podcast streaming platforms, most namely Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Over there, you're going to get very long, in-depth, existential, and emotional discussions about various pieces of art, mostly films up until this point. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please check it out. It would mean the world to me. Guys, thank you so much, as always, for watching. I will see you in the next video, and until then, Keep writing, keep shooting, and keep listening to Taylor fucking Swift.